Uh, although uh, Let's F app is a uh, catchy title, I can't claim it. So it was assigned to me as such. Um, today I'm going I'm to talk about VAP or ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, so basically I'm going to provide first an overview of some general comments um, why this is an important topic for, for this day in, in burns and trauma. Um, I'm going to go over some of the risk factors and, and th that's an important background for the, the meat of the lecture if you will which is prevention. And that's the, the, the greatest part that you all play with respect to ventilator associated pneumonia, the preventive measures. I'm going to go over uh, a couple a couple high points, uh, the importance of ventilator weaning uh, with respect to protocols and sedation, um, the importance of hand washing, um, and in patient position. And, and some, something new that I read about when I was preparing for this about the importance of patient positioning during intra-hospital transport. Okay? And then at the end, I'm gonna, gonna uh, end with um, a discussion about the diagnosis and treatment of that. And that's the, the important stuff that, that we talk about in fellowship and in residency, how to diagnose uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. And you hear about it, and we're talking about it on rounds. But this will give you a little more background in how we make our decisions for diagnosis and for treatment. Ventilator associated pneumonia is a pneumonia, um, and it's a parenchymal lung infection. So that means it's an infection in the distal airways, as opposed to the, the run of the mill bronchitis that we all get and get rid of. So this is low down. Um, and to be ventilator-associated pneumonia, um, it requires that the patient have been on the ventilator for at least 48 hours. Um, some papers talk about 72, but the, usually we're talking about 48 hours. Um, this is an important topic because it's the most, acquired, most common acquired infection in the ICU. So number one, up to 24% of patients on a ventilator more than 48 hours will get VAP. Um, there's about a 20 times increase in the rate of pneumonia in patients that are on a ventilator compared to those that are not. So 20 times, pretty impressive. Um, you'll hear every one of the, the staff talk about a different percentage each day. Um, the, the paper I looked at said that um, over the, if you break the, the first 15 days into blocks of five, during the first five days, your, your rate of, of VAP increases 3% each day. Days six to 10, 2% each of those days. And as you get further out, the rate goes down, but that's still pretty impressive. So, you know, 15% after five days. And the peak uh, incidence of VAP is on day number five. Consequences, mortality, length of stay, antibiotic use. So there, there's, you talk about absolute mortality, um, so patients who die, um, versus attributable, patients who die of the VAP. So the question is, are they dying because they have VAP, or are they dying because they're sick and they have VAP? And so there's a difference. So the absolute mortality can be up to 50%, um, whereas the, the attributed mortality can be a little over three times in terms of a relative risk. The length of stay can increase um, from anywhere from one to six days. And with respect to antibiotics, we always talk about antibiotic resistance um, and, of course, the almighty cost. So I'm going to talk about risk factors in, in two, two broad groups. The first, uh, in terms of general, um, pre-existing disease. So patients that come in with cardiac pulmonary, especially gastroesophageal reflux. Those are people that are at increased risk from the very beginning before they ever come in the hospital for getting VAP. In terms of why they get admitted, um, particularly relevant for this group, trauma, burn, and CNS, not only neurosurgery but neurosurgery, they're the, the patients at the highest risk. So medical ICU, not nearly the percentage, not nearly the risk as for, for trauma surgical patients. So specific risk factors, uh, once they're already in the hospital, the biggest risk factor, and, and the thing everyone here knows, is that the highest risk for developing VAP is being on the ventilator. And so it's the duration. We talked about three, two, one. So being on the ventilator and being on the ventilator longer is bad. Other things, a witnessed aspiration. Um, the gentleman that came in the other day from Mexico, I mean, he's got a pneumonia, and we all painfully saw, especially Jerry, how he got his. Um, we put nasogastric tubes in, and that increases aspiration. Um, we paralyze our patients, we suppress their stomach, which normally has such a high acid content that there's no bacteria. Then we give them Pepsid or we give them a proton pump inhibitor, make their pH normal, and then they get bacteria, and then those bacteria aspirate. Uh, people that we don't feed, okay, malnourished have a higher rate, and as, as Chris, the other fellow, talked about earlier, um, blood transfusion. So just getting blood transfusion doubles your risk of getting VAP just getting one blood transfusion alone. So just a few more comments about the, the duration of mechanical ventilation. This, once again, the most important factor for developing VAP. 
does a, a different, couple different mechanisms. So your endotracheal tube will damage the mucosa. It impairs your mucociliary clearance. It impairs your cough. You get secretions above the tube. All those things will lead to the, the chance of aspiration. So prevention, how do we tie in the risk factors to prevention? Um, the two things that you look at are bacterial colonization um, and aspiration. And so those are the two things that you need to direct preventive measures at. Um, there's a number of things they talk about in the literature. I'm going to talk about five really in particular. Um, the most important thing, as we talked about, is to, to wean and extubate. So get the tube out. Get the tube out, then you don't get VAP. Hand washing, everyone does it. It's a common, common sense. We just need to make sure we continue to do it. Other things they talk about are mouth care, preventing sinusitis. I'm not going to touch on those today, but those, for the same two reasons, bacterial colonization makes sense. Um, we keep people in a semi-recumbent position. So the H of fast hugs, you know, 30 to 45 degrees. Um, and then you can also aspirate continuously above the ET tube. So as I talked about, you want to wean the patient and get him off the ventilator. Well, we use the STEER protocol. And the key thing about the STEER protocol, two, two key things. One, that it happens daily. So you daily assess the patient whether or not they can wean and extubate. And the second one is that, that I don't do it. And Dr. Coimber doesn't do it. And the residents don't do it. You guys do it. The nurses do it. The RTs do it. Um, and they've studied this extensively. Um, and they found that, that um, using a non-physician directed weaning protocol, weaning starts earlier. It takes less time to do. And overall, the patients spend in an average two days less on the ventilator as opposed to 15 years ago where the physician would come and make all the changes independently, two days, so pretty impressive. So if those are two days out of your first five, that's 6% less. Also related to your uh, being on the ventilator, sedation. So two big things about sedation. So we do our, our daily sedation vacation, okay? So the, when, especially the night shift nurses, that's supposed to be done at 5 a.m., getting ready for, for rounding in the morning. Um, and then the other thing is that the sedation is protocol driven. So the sedation vacation happens daily. Um, you stop the drugs or, or go to a real low rate until the patient wakes up. Um, and it allows the minimal dose with effect and it allows a good neuro exam. This maneuver alone, this, this daily um, sedation holiday, if you will, cuts down the, the duration of ventilation two days, again. Using your sedation by a protocol also decreases the amount of sedation and thus decreasing your amount of time in the vent. So, so both of these factors, both having a protocol that's not doctor directed and a protocol for your sedation, those interplay to make, give you less time on the ventilator. And just to, uh, to go over our, how we sedate, um, so you know, in our sedation orders, you guys know much better than we do that you, we select a RAS, okay? And then you wanna go with the lowest RAS possible um, because once again, less time on the ventilator. So that covers two. So number three out of five, hand washing. So um, the two main ways that you can wash your hands are uh, the hand rubbing with alcohol-based solution and traditional soap and water. Well, surprising to me uh, to find out, actually the alcohol-based solution rubbing is much better. Uh, studying the bacterial load and bacterial load before and after each method, 25% better with the alcohol-based solution. Um, this little, little graphic here just came from one of the internet presentations, just a reminder about hand washing. Now, whether, whether it's the, uh, um, the agent being used or whether it's the fact that you get better compliance, it's difficult to, to, to make out in, in the papers that I read. But, but either way, using the alcohol is better. And uh, I hope that's my one typo. Uh, just, it's not, not effective for C. diff. So the alcohol, alcohol is not good enough. That should be an I, not a U. So number four, into two parts, patient positioning. So once again, the H of the fast hugs. So we want all our patients to be in the semi-recumbent position. So sometimes if, they, if they're hypotensive or they have some kind of head injury or some, there's some factors that prevent us from being in the semi-recumbent position. Actually, head injury usually wanted that way, but there's some instances that you don't want it. But usually our patients are gonna be 30 to 45 degrees. The way that works is that it reduces reflux, and by reducing reflux, it reduces the aspiration. Um, comparing the rates of VAP in the semi-recumbent as compa well, comparing them in the supine as a pair opposed to the semi-recumbent, the rates are between 20 and 30 supine versus less than 10 semi-recumbent. Um, although we all do the, the head of the bed at 45 degrees, it really, really doesn't have an effect on mortality, but it does cut down the rate of app. And once again, another little, little sign to be used. 
Um, if if you can, if their their spine is cleared, you can elevate the head of the bed. If not, you put them in reverse Schindelenburg. So this is what I learned about preparing for this. <clears throat> I'm talking about intra-hospital transport and the effect um, that has with respect to patient position. So up to 50% of the patients in the ICU will need to be transported, usually to go to radiology. In those comparing those patients transported to those that were not transported, there was a three times increase in the rate of uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, although there was an increase in the rate of pneumonia, it didn't affect mortality, but still the rate of pneumonia is very important. The, the reasons postulated were that oftentimes they transported the patient in the supine position. Um, oftentimes they had to manipulate the circuits and that it's that manipulation that contaminated the circuits and that they had technical difficulties with suctioning. So th the recommendations that, that uh, the literature talks about that, that we actually do, some of them we do, some of them not so much. So obviously everyone checks equipment before we transport. Um, suction the endotracheal tube. Um, they recommended checking the position and the cuff pressure both. Uh, and then we, we stop tube feeds, okay? But uh, as I understand it, we don't necessarily aspirate the gastric contents. So if they've got a full stomach, that may put them at risk, okay? And then the last thing is transporting them in the, in the semi-recumbent position. Yeah. So we do that, but still they go into the CT scanner and they're supine. So you're gonna have that, that point at risk that you wanna, you wanna minimize the full stomach if you can, make sure you got suctioning available. And the other thing that they pointed out was if somebody goes down for a CT scan or some other study, having a really high index of suspicion more so than normal for the days that follow the transport. So now to, now to, to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about the diagnosis and treatment uh, from, the, from the MD standpoint. So there's, there's two main ways that we diagnose VAP. One is uh, qualitative, and that's sort of the, the first way we talk about, that's sort of our screening way. And, and basically we use a, a total of four criteria. The first criteria that usually sets us off is that their chest x-ray is abnormal, so they have an infiltrate. Once they have that, they've got to meet at least two um, of the following three criteria. They've got to have a temperature greater than 38.3, they've got to have an elevated white blood cell count, and they've got to have secretions. If, they ha and it, if the patient has ARDS, some people will talk about only using one of those criteria. If they meet this clinical diagnosis, you need to treat them. You don't need to wait for something else, we need to treat them. And as I'll get to, it's, it's very important that once they meet this, we start treatment promptly with the correct drug. The second mode of diagnosis is the quantitative, okay? And that's based on culture. There's a couple different ways to obtain cultures. Uh, we can do endotracheal aspirates. You can do BAL, which stands for bronchoalveolar lavage. You can do PSB, which stands for protected specimen brush. We can do it bronchoscopic. We can do it non-bronchoscopic. Um, the method that we're using to diagnose VAP now is bronchoscopic with BAL. Ideally, that's the way we get our cultures. Um, interestingly, of all these quantitative methods, there's no difference in mortality um, based on what kind of method you use for diagnosis. So how do we use the diagnosis to treat, the methods of diagnosis to treat? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, you suspect a pneumonia based on your qualitative criteria. Chest x-ray, and then two of the three, fever, white count, and secretions. So once you have that, you want to treat. Um, if you want to get cult if you can, you want to get your secretions first for your culture, and then start antibiotics. The problem is obviously if you start the antibiotic, you could you could cut down the bacterial number and, and you won't be as good with your culture. So you obtain your secretions for culture, you start your antibiotics, and, and the, the two things important about your antibiotics are that they be appropriate, and the key the definition of appropriate is that the regimen that you start will be efficacious in your cultures. So your cultures come back and the bug that came out was sensitive to the drug that you used. And you, you base that and you decide what's appropriate based on your suspected pathogens. And so the, the suspected pathogens vary by country, they vary by state, they vary by city, they vary by hospital, and they vary by ICU within the hospital. So we have our, our antibodygram um, that the pharmacy keeps, and so we know, we know what bacteria are the most likely and, and what those bacteria are most sensitive, and that's how we decide which, bec which antibiotic to go with. It's, good to ha it's important to do the, use the right antibiotic, but just as important is that you do it in a prompt, timely fashion. So we diagnose, the, use the clinical criteria at 3 p.m. We get a chest x-ray infiltrate, we get fever and a white count at 3 p.m. So when should we start 
giving antibiotics. 301, you shouldn't wait till the next day. Okay, so the key thing is that you're, you're doing it promptly. So once you start your empiric treatment, you send your, you, you send your cultures off, you start your antibiotics, then you reevaluate when the cultures come back. And that's why we keep checking. And usually it takes about 72 hours. At this point, you, reveal your cult, you review your culture results. And that's your quantitative, right? So your bowel um, or your PSB. For us, bronchoscopic bowel. Then based on that, how the patient's doing, whether something else has come up in the meantime, they had a PE or an MI that might have explained your previous screening method, um, you de-escalate your antibiotics. So you switch to uh, one that, you switch to the um, lesser antibiotic, the less broad spectrum, if you will. And by doing so, you avoid drug resistance. So <clears throat> talking about how to, how to come up with your antibiotics and the pathogens, the vast majority of pathogens involved in VAP are gram negatives, okay? Um, you, you, bake, you, you differentiate in terms of what bug you're suspecting and in, in what anti, uh, antibiotic based on whether it's an early onset or late onset and whether or not the patient has risk factors to, be, um, to have resistant bugs. So whether if they come from a nursing home, if they've been in the hospital recently, if they've been on the ventilator for, for days, if they've been on other antibiotics or broad spectrum antibiotics, you'd expect those bugs to be more resistant. And so you, you pick your antibiotic based on that. So early onset, the bugs most commonly uh, encountered are Staph aureus, H flu, strep pneumonia, and Moraxella cateralis. And the, the various agents recommended um, are listed. The agent I think we use the most commonly is ceftriaxone. So for that early, less than five days, bug that you don't expect to be resistant. For the late onset, so five days or more, or those that have one of the risk factors, you, the most common uh, bacteria is, is Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, MRSA, and Stenotrophomonas. So those are the most common, most common bugs, and, and the, the national recommendations are for combination therapy. So the first category there, you've got Cefepime, Ceftaz, uh, Imipenem, Meripenem, or Zosin, so one of the three. And the antibiotic you see us using routinely is Zosin. So you need one of those, then you need either a, flu a fluoroquinolone, whether it be levofloxacin or Cipro, or um, aminoglycoside. And then, the, and then the last one would be vancomycin or linazolid. As I mentioned before, the, the, the bug that you get and the resistance patterns vary by everything. And it just so happens in our ICUs, um, the, the, the bugs, in particular Pseudomonas, are, are more sensitive to just one, one drug. So in these particular, if we suspect these bugs, the combination of Zosin and Vanc should be sufficient for empiric antibiotics. But thinking bigger picture nationwide, um, a lot of centers have to use three to double cover, especially for Pseudomonas. So adequate or appropriate antibiotics versus inappropriate. There's just a number of different studies which, which pretty easily, let's see, they just compare adequate versus inadequate therapy. And this is mortality. So if you start wrong with the wrong empiric antibiotic, your mortality is, is doubled. So this is just, you need, you need to use the right antibiotic. And so, let's see, can somebody tell me what antibiotic we're gonna pick for uh, pneumonia in a patient who hasn't been in the hospital, not in antibiotics, on day three? What's the most common antibiotic we use? Ceftriaxone, okay. What about a patient who's coming from a nursing home, has been in the ICU for seven days on Cipro and Flagyl? What combination? Zosin and Vank. Okay, good. So you gotta have the right drug, but you also have to give it promptly, okay? So you, you diagnose it with your, your qualitative uh, criteria at three o'clock, you start your antibiotics at 3.01. They, they studied this, and, and using 24 hours as the, you do it before 24 hours, and it's not delayed, you do it after 24 hours, it's delayed. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, you're giving people a lot of room there. They found that, that up to a third of patients who had met criteria didn't get started on treatment until after 24 hours. And the most common reason for that delay was not writing the orders. I mean, you, you, that's, that's crazy. I mean, you, you, you see that and it's crazy. But the key thing is, is that, you know, it, remind us, you know, we're, these people are meeting, hey, does this person have VAP? Why, why aren't we starting antibiotics? Please. Um, they found that those people who had delays in antibiotics had more bacteremia, they had more mortality, and they had more VAP-associated mortality. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, talked about 
the definition of app. We talked about why it's important. Um, we talked about some uh, modes of prevention, so weaning protocols, sedation protocols, washing your hands, particularly with alcohol-based formulas, um, semi-recumbent positioning, being careful when you move patients, and then just talked about briefly how, how we diagnose and then treat VAP. Questions?